Morning, everyone. How are y'all doing today? Great. <laughs> um, well, it's it's so good to have you all here today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Mackert. I'm the director of the UT Austin Center for Health Communication. And on behalf of our center and the College of Communication and the medical school, really want to welcome you to today's lecture. Um, this McGovern lecture in health communication has been going on since a gift in 1983 from the John P. McGovern Foundation. And over the years, it's been traditionally one speaker. And so my very first year at UT, Neil Bear was here, and he gave this talk about how Law & Order SVU that he created was a tool for studying and shaping how people understand public health issues. Um, Siddhartha Mukherjee came in one year and talked about his biography of cancer book and kind of the future of genetics and storytelling. And our last McGovern lecture was um, Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, who talked about kind of the federal government and the response to COVID and what we could do better the next time. Um, this year we're trying something a little bit different. And instead of one speaker, we've converted it into a series. Like there's a lot of exciting things going on in health communication. Having more people offering more perspectives felt like a good way to go this year. And so this year we're actually going to have a series of McGovern lectures instead of just one for the whole year. And so we're really excited to kick things off with Heather this year. Uh, before we invite up Heather as our first speaker, though, I want to share a couple uh, bits of Center for Health Com News because um, we're not doing our normal monthly all hands meetings. And so just want to kind of celebrate a, a couple successes and share a little bit of news before we go in. So one of the things that we haven't really announced publicly yet uh, is that we've awarded two pilot grants in our share grant program this year. And so this is the program that brings together Moody and DelMed faculty to pursue health com research. There's a number of folks in this room who've received these grants over the years, and it's been a really successful program for making Moody DelMed connections. And then those teams going on to kind of do really cool projects, go pursue more funding. Um, and so these are the two that we awarded this year, which we're very excited for them to get going. Um, we've opened up registrations for this year's Health Communication Leadership Institute, which is our three-day, thankfully again, in-person event for folks from the CDC, state health departments, um, to come to Austin and focus on health come leadership and best practices. So we're very excited. This year, we already have some sponsors and supporters lined up with St. David's, Texas Department of State Health Services, and the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute. Um, registrations are open. We're excited to kind of bring probably about 60 or so folks to Austin again this year. Uh, we just launched a new course in our health communication training series. Uh, the most recent course focuses on visual design in health com. That class launched about a week ago. Uh, and we're currently in production on a new course focused on kind of health com as a tool for pandemic preparedness and response. So that's the next class that's going to launch in partnership uh, with that text epidemic group. Uh, and the last thing, this is news. It's not out yet. We're just in the very early planning stages, but we're planning on a new podcast series. Um, some advertising and PR students in the fall suggested a podcast series as a way to kind of help spread what the Center for Health Com is up to. And so we're going to kind of try out a four kind of episode series to pilot it. Uh, that we're going to be calling Talking About Talking About Health. So sometime this semester, we'll launch kind of the first four episodes and see how it goes. It's a, a fun way to, Susan Kurtz is smiling because Susan Kurtz and Haley uh, were two of the people who simultaneously thought that'd be a really great podcast title. Uh, and we're excited to kind of take that for a test drive. So, uh, oh, and before I go into Heather, one last note here. You can see here, this is a, a bus that was driving by CMV, actually. Um, this is the Spanish language version of the Turn To campaign that our center is involved with. So we were doing research on this on this campaign for the state of Texas for six, seven months before a media agency joined the team. And this is now part of the state's biggest ever public health campaign and it's substance use uh, prevention. So it's very upstream, very get connected to folks. We're really excited. The campaign's out there, lots of new things coming, but it's always fun to just be driving through Texas and see billboards that we helped create. So I'm um, just very excited about that, that work and that team and it being out in the world. So. Uh, when we had the chance to kind of rethink this as a series and not an individual lecture, and who could we have come as the first person in this new adventure? Uh, the very first person that came to mind was Heather Voorhees, because Heather has repeatedly blazed new trails for our center. She shot video for our first ever online ed course. Um, she was our first ever remote hire. So before COVID, we were doing Skype interviews to recruit a postdoc to work on a project focused on mental health and health communication. And it was very strange to do these interviews with a person we hadn't met in real life. Like going back in time, this felt very weird. And Heather accepted a job without having ever met us in person. And so I think the first day we met was when you showed up on your first day of work yeah. and we had to get you to the office. Yeah. Um, and so I was really excited to work with Heather for a year. Her postdoc was the last few months were remote because of COVID. Uh, but she's just been really wonderful to work with. And her work on misinformation is really interesting. I always think of misinformation as 
social media and mass media campaigns, it's like the very mass media version of misinformation. And so the chance to have Heather come in and talk about the more interpersonal side of misinformation felt like one of those new perspectives that we really wanted to bring in this year. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Heather Voorhees to give our first uh, talk in the McGovern Lecture Series this year. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Happy Friday. I'm told it's cold here today. <laughs> That's cute. Uh, so hello, I'm Heather Voorhees. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Montana, and I am very excited to be across the country here in Austin, Texas today. I'm talking to you about a question I think maybe a lot of us have asked ourselves over the past year or maybe 10, 5, 20 years, right? Why won't you listen to reason talking about interpersonal health mis uh, miscommunication and misinformation? So um, before I get started, um, I would... There we go. I would like to carry on a tradition that is um, really important to us in Missoula, Montana. And so I would like to acknowledge that while I am in Austin, Texas, um, I am walking on the occupied ancestral territory of the Tonkawa, Lipan Apache, Karankawa, Comanche, and Kawiltikans people. And I am grateful to these stewards of the land. So thank you very much. I'm glad we can all be here today because of their kind, because of their work, right? Um, so who the hell am I and why are you listening to me? Great question. Um, so just in a nutshell, to give you some context of how I come to this topic, I think it's important for you to get a little bit of background of who I am. Um, so uh, I was uh, born and raised in Minnesota. Hi, mom. Um, and I, that's where I got my master's degree in strategic comm. Um, I went to University of Nebraska GBR for my doctoral um, degree. And of course, I came here um, sight unseen to join the CHC as a postdoctoral uh, fellow. So before I came to academia, I actually came a little bit later in life. Um, I had two full careers before I became a professor. I started out as a newspaper journalist, which was amazing. Um, and then I went into corporate communication, which was also super fun. Um, and that's where I really started understanding um, the way that people talk about health is really, really important and it's really different. My corporate communication ex experience was at the largest healthcare system in the Twin Cities. And so I worked with uh, specialists, I worked with nurses, I worked with janitors, I worked with patients, I worked with everyone. And that's where I really got interested in talking about health, right? So my research doesn't um, focus necessarily on what sometimes we think of when we think of about health communication, big campaigns, right? Public health campaigns, messaging, things like that. I focus on the person-to-person -person communication aspect. Um, and so specifically, I, I work in the chronic illness context. So I'm interested in things like illness identity, um, disclosure, social support. And I'm starting to notice that throughout all of these things, health misinformation worms its way in, right? Um, it, it touches on everything that we do. So that's how I became interested in this topic. I have not yet um, started a specific research project around interpersonal health miscommunication. I am hoping to start one. So perhaps today you can lob some good questions at me and give me some avenues to really focus on this area. But, but that's kind of where I'm coming from and that's uh, where I'd like to take you today. So as Mike said, um, we, we often think, when we think health misinformation, what do you think? What comes to your mind? Twitter, yes. First thing, right? That just a cesspool for misinformation. Um, absolutely. And, and most of the research that I've come across in doing background uh, research on this is in the mass media realm, and rightfully so. Mass media and social media are very, very important tools for spreading information and mis misinformation. But I think we often overlook the power of person-to-person -person communication, interpersonal communication, um, because interpersonal communication is really, really powerful. And if you want to even look at it as part of the mosaic, interpersonal communication can either complement or can help us fight back against messages that we get on social media and mass media. So um, think about if you see a, a thing on the news about a new miracle cure for something, right? If it's really interesting to you, you're probably going to go and talk to someone about it. So interpersonal communication weaves its way into the mosaic of how we learn and talk about health. So that's where I'm coming from today. Um, I'm also... I created a class for this for my undergrads in Montana uh, last fall, and teaching, um, teaching a class called Health Misinformation is always a little bit dicey, right? Especially I come from a very proudly red state. Um, so what I like to do is absolutely acknowledge that, that politics are related to information, misinformation, health. Absolutely, right? 
But I think in order for us to kind of rise above that and see each other as, as people and get past some of those things, we have to understand the, the underlying things um, that cause us to spread and share and believe health misinformation. So um, you won't see a whole lot about your politics here, um, but believe me, it's there, right? Um, all of these things kind of feed into those ideas of why certain people believe certain things. So we're going we're gonna to take it a little bit deeper today. So to that end, I'm going to start with just some foundational definitions, just some things I think we, we all kind of need to be on the same level as we go through. Um, then I will talk about why misinformation spreads interpersonally. Why do people that you love tell you things that sound bongo to you, right? And, and then I'm going to give you a couple strategies to push back. I do not have all the answers by any means, um, but I do have some suggestions and ideas for all of us going forward. So um, let's kind of get on the same ground here. What do I mean when I say misinformation? So there's kind of different levels of misinformation, if you will. Misinformation is this idea that it's information that is simply incorrect, right? So it can be spread either accidentally or intentionally, um, but it's just information that's maybe not right, okay? People aren't necessarily trying to persuade you or fool you or trick you. It's just things that aren't correct, right? Um, think about someone sharing a news article about some miracle cure and it's from 2005. Well, is that still relevant? No, right? That's misinformation, okay? Now, next, kind of down the spectrum, we have malinformation. You maybe heard this term. This is the idea that the information stems from a nugget of truth. There's something there, but someone is intentionally massaging that message to persuade you of something or to try to get something from you. So it stems from the truth, but it's been manhandled a little bit, right? So think about a, con uh, a quote from someone that's been taken out of context. That's the idea of malinformation. Someone's manipulating that data a little bit to kind of get you to do or feel something, okay? Down the spectrum, we have disinformation. This is, this is just the flat out lies. Um, so this is inaccurate information that is deliberately spread in order to deceive you, okay? Th there is a lot of this out there um, and it's hard to tell what is and what isn't, misinformation versus disinformation, right? I'm gonna focus mostly kind of on the, the first two because this is sort of its own beast that I do not feel confident taking on by myself. Um, so when we talk about interpersonal communication, usually it's people who, who know you and like you who are trying to help out. Maybe they think they're being helpful. They're not trying to intentionally fool you or con you. And if they are, you should find new friends. So we're gonna focus on the relationships that matter today. So as we go through too, I think it's important to understand some of the characteristics of health misinformation because it'll help you identify it a little bit easier, okay? First, um, health misinformation, malinformation, disinformation, it tends to be negative. We don't get a lot of hot goss about super positive stuff in health, right? It's always so-and-so is trying to kill you and that'll kill you and this will give you cancer, right? So it tends to be negative. And there's a reason for that, because when you're scared or when you're angry, you're more susceptible to information, okay? So especially in, in um, disinformation, if someone's trying to sell you something or make you believe something, they're going to try to freak you out first, okay? So it tends to be negative. It's often based on personal stories. And this is where it gets really tricky, right? So we, we'll hear stories of, you know, my cousin got the COVID vaccine and then he uh, went into the psychiatric ward 16 days later. So you make your own connections, right? It, it tends to be positive. We tend to share stories that seem personal to us because those are more effective, right? It's not, well, I read in the USA Today that blah, 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 blah. No, it's something happened to someone I know. Uh, lastly, health mis, mal, and disinformation um, it tends to use anti-science narratives. My branded water bottle from the CHC. Um, and what that means is um, they're not even necessarily giving you new information. They're trying to cast doubt on the things that you already believe. And you have heard this before. I'm just asking questions. I'm just asking questions, right? Um, that, is, that is code for, uh, I believe you're smart enough to see what's really going on here, right? So it's, it's, it's not just saying that, um, believe this thing I'm telling you, it's don't believe science. Don't believe the experts. They're not on your side, right? So if you recognize any of these in a piece of information that someone is telling you, eh, the little light bulb's going to go off, then maybe there's something more to this here, okay? So those are kind of our foundational terms. But now let's get to the good stuff. Why do people tell us this stuff? Why is this even a thing? 
Um, so number one, uh, Gesundheit, is the idea that science is messy, right? Science is a process of constantly questioning and disproving ourselves. Science is built on this idea that we think we know something and now we're gonna work a little bit harder and bang, howdy, we got some new evidence. Now it changes everything we know. That's what science does. It's constantly making us look past us look like liars, right? Because we're finding new information. That's the point. But to people who are not necessarily familiar with the scientific process, this can be confusing and that can start to build distrust. So think about, um, think about eggs. Oh, poor eggs. Eggs have been so maligned, right? First eggs were so good for you. Oh, they're great. And then eggs were bad for you. Do you remember in the 80s and the 90s, eggs are gonna clog your arteries. Oh, don't eat those eggs. And then 10 years later, eggs are like a healthy source of protein, right? We keep going up and down and that's okay. That's what science is supposed to do. We're supposed to keep learning things and proving old things wrong, okay? But that can look really confusing and that can start to build distrust. Let's look at another really good example that I think you'll enjoy. Um, let's look at ulcers. So if there's any, we're not gonna, we're not gonna look at a real ulcer. I saw the looks that, no, don't worry about that. Let's, ex let's examine communication around ulcers. Um, so for the MDs in the room, I ask you to abstain here, but what causes ulcers? Stomach acid, great idea, yeah. What else? Stress, yeah, what else? <laughs> Your boss, yeah, for sure, right? Stress, yeah, absolutely. Stress is like, the, oh, if you get to, you're gonna give yourself an ulcer, right? We've all heard that. Don't worry, you're gonna give yourself an ulcer, right? Think about um, spicy food. Oh, you're gonna burn a hole in that stomach. Oh, that's gonna be bad for you. Think about overconsumption. You drink too much. Oh, well, you're gonna drink yourself into an ulcer. Um, think about caffeine. Coffee is often uh, you just thrown to the to the side for here. Think about smoking. All of these things cause ulcers, right? No, no, none of them do. No. A at some point in history, we believe that every single thing, every single one of these was the cause of ulcers. So for a long time, we just worked under the assumption that these things were, were going to give you an ulcer. Um, but um, we have actually recorded ulcers throughout history starting in like the 1600s. Isn't that wild? So we've always, we've always had these problems, um, but we were never really sure what caused them. So in 1982, two Australian science, scientists, Robert Warren and Barry J. Marshall, here he is, nice looking guy, um, they felt that ulcers and gastritis was actually called by, caused by bacteria instead of any of these things. But they couldn't quite prove it. And they were having some problems with the IRB, which you know, we've all been there, right? So what they did to test this hypothesis is in an act of bold and brazen self-experimentation, Mr. Marshall here actually drank a Petri dish containing a sample of a patient's stomach acid to, to, yeah, to try to get the bacteria into his own system. He was the guinea pig, okay? Um, sure enough, he developed uh, an ulcer. Five, you know, five days later, he developed gastritis. Um, he had all the symptoms. Um, it actually worked itself out of his system in about two weeks. Um, he actually, fun fact, he actually did end up taking some um, antibiotics because his wife insisted on it because one of the um, side effects of an ulcer is bad breath. <laughs> and his wife was like, you got it, we're done with this. So in um, 1984, he published this article and he actually didn't tell anyone that it was a self-experimentation. He said it was a sample of one, one brave volunteer. Um, and so that was published in the Australian Medical Journal. It's the most cited article from that journal to this day. Um, he won a uh, Nobel Prize in medicine in 2005 for his work. So what's the point here? D don't drink stomach acid, I guess is number one point. But number two, it took really smart people hundreds of years and lots of proving ourselves wrong to come to the right conclusion. Does that mean science is broken? No, this is what science is supposed to do. But instead, again, if you're a lay person, maybe you don't have a lot of um, health literacy, maybe you don't have a ton of um, you know, education or interest in science, it might look like, well, stupid idiots. They thought it was that for those folks. So, so dumb, scientists don't know anything. No, this is what we're supposed to do, okay? There was a really, really nice quote from an amazing book that I recommend that you read um, it called The Misinformation Age. 
And this is the idea, the book is all about why we believe misinformation. And um, this idea here is that um, experts being wrong on occasion about certain issues is not the same thing as experts being consistently wrong on everything, okay? Scientists are not perfect. They, we make mistakes sometimes, and sometimes we prove ourselves wrong. That's okay. That doesn't negate the entire field of health information, okay? But that's one reason that people could look at things that we are know and are discovering today and go, ah, they don't know what they're talking about, right? It builds that distrust, okay? So we have that, that groundwork of this distrust, right? And what happens is, building on that, um, humans don't like uncertainty, I think I, some of us study uncertainty, right? Uncertainty is very uncomfortable for us. We like to feel in control. We like to believe that we have the answers. Even if we don't like the answers, we like to believe that we know them, okay? Um, but the idea is that health is all about uncertainty. You guys, we still don't know a whole lot about the human body in, in the vast scheme of things. We know a whole lot more than we used to, but there's still so much that we don't know. And that makes people uncomfortable. Right? Why did why did I get cancer and someone who lived the exact same life as me didn't? We don't know. There's a lot of stuff that science can't answer, and that creates this level of uncertainty, which breeds um, distrust. Because fear again makes us hungry for information that comforts us. So if we're looking for an answer and we're scared about the topic, we're going to latch on to the things that give us comfort that make us feel like we're in control. A lot of health misinformation is selling you the idea of control. This is the idea of motivated reasoning. We strive for a sense of consistency among um, our attitudes and our beliefs and behaviors. We want to feel like we're doing the right thing. So when we're presented with two pieces of information, one that confirms what I'm doing and one that tells me I'm wrong, what do you think I'm going to attach to? The thing that tells me I'm right, right? Because then I'm certain that I'm sure in myself. Um, so we're, we're more accepting of consistent information um, and we're more skeptical of information that seems to imply that we're doing something wrong or that we didn't know the truth. Oh, what happened? there we go. Uh, a really good example of this is there was a study of um, women who frequently drank coffee and they tended to discount information that found a link between ca caffeine consumption and the risk of fibrocystic breast disease because they don't want to give up their coffee, right? They talked to, two, they talked to these people and they, and they gave them two pieces of information. And the coffee drinkers were like, nah, I don't believe that. That can't be, right? Of course it is. We want to confirm what we've already believed, okay? There is a really, really early theory out there that uh, kind of extends this idea of uncertainty. It's the basic law of rumors. It's all the way from 1947. And this says that the importance of the subject multiplied by the ambiguity of evidence leads to the total number of rumors in circulation, okay? Health has all of those things. Health is incredibly important to all of us. It's, it's everything, right? And again, there's still so much that we don't know. So that's why there's so many, oh, if you eat pineapple rinds, you, you, your hair will grow fancy, right? Like there's all these rumors out there. And that's why, because this is an important topic and there's so much that we don't know. So people are trying to create that information to give them that sense of certainty. So, so we, we create, uh, I keep doing this. We create rumors. Um, I'm going to throw two more facts at you, two more. It's like you're in class today. I hope you're taking notes. Um, there's, some, there's some rules or some explanations for why rumors persist, right? So that, the, the idea of uncertainty, that explains why rumors start. But why do they persist? Why do we keep sharing this in, misinformation? A couple of reasons. Number one, the idea of illusory truth. This is the more we hear something, the more we tend to believe it, even if we academically understand it is not correct. I came down with a cold last weekend. What do you think I did to help cure that cold? Tea? Absolutely. Yes. What else? Chicken noodle soup? Absolutely. I was, I was shotgunning tangerines like you wouldn't believe. Ah, tangerines. Right. And I, I may have had some whiskey to help. Right. Because everyone knows that vitamin C is going to make your cold go away. Everyone knows that a little nip here and there is going to make you feel better. Right. No, the, actually, the evidence is, is pretty clear. Vitamin C doesn't do as much as we think it does. Um, and I know that I know that. But I still ate those tangerines. Right. Because part of me was like, oh, these tangerines. Eat the chicken soup. I don't know. Keep doing that. Um, so illusory truth, the more we hear it, even though we understand that it's wrong, the more we're going to believe it. 
There's also something called the availability heuristic. That's just a fancy term for saying that we place more weight on claims that are vivid and that are simple, okay? And here's the problem. Health is really complicated. And a lot of times it's super boring. Um, I, I'm, I'm a researcher. I write and read research. A lot of it is very boring, right? So if you give me a colorful, easy to remember narrative, I'm going to attach to that. How many of you, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, um, have some sort of product in your house that has activated charcoal in it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you mean if I eat some coal, my insides are going to be clean? I like that, right? That's, uh, I'm going to get behind that. It, no, I hate to break this to you. The charcoal is doing literally nothing. And in some cases, it may be actually doing you harm. But it's a cool thing. Uh, eat some coal, feel better. I love that, right? So that, that's the myth that we keep perpetuating, okay? So this information is out there and even smart people get, get caught up in it. Health misinformation isn't about people being dumb. Absolutely not. It's about humans being humans, okay? So number three, this idea of... Burp, burp. There we go. Um, there's also um, some social reasons for why we attach ourselves to health misinformation, okay? Um, beyond the idea of kind of distrust and not really understanding science and things like that, um, there's something called the social identity theory. And this is the idea that we attach ourselves to groups that are positive. And those groups then shape the way that we move through the world. They shape our communication and our beliefs, right? We all want to be thought of as, as really high-ranking, important people. So we attach ourselves to groups um, that we think are going to get us there. We all came to UT Austin because it's a great uh, environment, right? We, we're not going to go to crappy schools. We're going to go to the best schools. So we align ourselves with that, okay? Um, but here's the idea. When you start connecting your identity to how you communicate, which we all do, um, that can be opportunities for um, it to change the way that you think and believe about health, right? So there are some identities that um, are a little bit more prone or leave you a little bit more or less open to certain types of health misinformation. There are, there are pieces of information that we attach to because it verifies our belonging in a group. So let me give you an example. Um, athletes are actually targeted all the time for health, myth, health misinformation. Why? Because their body's a temple, right? Their body is their, is their life. It's their tool. And so think about all the supplements, think about training regimens, think about all that stuff out there, the protein powder that comes in the jugs, right? Athletes are, are often targeted for health misinformation. Are you a hippie? Are you a, a, a nature mother? Uh, and I'm not using that, I'm not using that negatively. I have lovely hippies in my life. I love them. Um, but think about, think about oils, think about crystals, think about healing energy, right? I'm not here to dump on alternative medicines, not in the least. But if you are using your essential oil diffuser to cure your cancer, that's problematic, right? So there are certain types of things that go with your identity. Why am I hippie? I'm not going to go get chemo. I'm going to use my frankincense oil. Okay, well, that's a choice. Think about, are you an active senior? Think about all these anti-aging. I love that, anti-aging. Spoiler alert, you're still aging. <laughs> you, nothing's going to stop that. Um, but think about it. You seniors are actually targeted a lot for health misinformation because getting old is scary. Things break down. You're starting to think about your finale, right? And that fear leaves us open to misinformation, okay? So there's definitely an identity piece of this. And I think that's where we see the, the politics come in, right? If you align yourself as a hard blue or hard red person, you're, you're, the people around you are telling you certain things. And you're more prone to believe them to fit in with that group, right? Even again, academically, if you don't necessarily believe them. This was a wonderful study from 2022 um, around the anti-vax movement in Australia. And so they asked all these anti-vax um, activists, what, what, what brings you into this group? Why, why are you here? And they saw themselves as being courageous, informed, and responsible. Because they saw this, they saw refusing all vaccines for their kids as a brave act of resisting dishonest communication of compromised research. They see themselves as heroes who are standing up for their kids. That's part of their identity. I'm a great mom. I'm a great dad. I'm not going to let my kid be, be bought into that, right? It's part of who they are. Um, they, they view it as kind of just fighting for their kids. 
So think about that. Think about some of the health misinformation that rolls around and think about how it, it um, kind of touches part of you, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a health com professor. Do I wear masks on planes? A hundred percent, right? Um, because that's what health com professors do. Would I feel weird not doing that? Yeah, because that social identity kind of frames the way that I think about and communicate health, okay? Um, so last but not least, a really basic point of why health misinformation spreads from person to person is we trust the people around us. Again, if you have people in your lives trying to, you know, disinformation, uh, steal your money, you need better friends. Come talk to me. I'll be your friend. Um, but we, we, we trust the people around us to have our best interest at heart. We see this time and time again in numerous contexts. Um, we see it in marketing all the time. Right? When you're going to buy a car, what do you do? You go to Consumer Reports, and then you ask around. Hey, do you like your Subi? Hey, do you like, oh, yeah, okay, right? I, everyone in my family owns a Subaru. There's a reason for that, right? You trust the people around you to give you good uh, information. The same thing is true, though, for things that aren't marketing-related. Um, this was a study. I come from fire country, right? We have fire season in Montana, and so... Um, they found that when considering the probability of a wildfire and, and whether or not you should prep, people actually um, believed their neighbors as much as they believed the experts. We trust the people we surround ourselves with. That's our crew, that's our people. That's the point of having those people around us, right? But here's the problem. Even if your friends and family members want to give you good information, sometimes they don't. Because as we know, information gets distorted the more it spreads. We've all played telephone, right? Purple monkey dishwasher. We all know how a message can get really, really distorted. Because when we repeat messages, a couple of different things happen. First of all, the messages get shorter and less accurate. Watch yourself do this. Someone will tell you about, oh yeah, I saw a thing on um, 2020 last night and it was about um, breast cancer patients in Oklahoma and their three-year lifespan. And then you go home later that day and you're like, there's this thing on some news about some cancer people. Yeah, right? When we repeat things, we kind of cut out information because our brain can't retain all those details. The um, negative statements actually increase. So the more we're repeating something from person to person to person, it tends to slide negative, okay? Um, the risk perception influences how we actually um, share the story. People who have higher risk perception are more inclined to leave out positive statements and to stress the harm of something. So if people are constantly, you have those people in your life, they're always worried about something. They're always scared about something, right? The messages they give you are going to be more about the harms and the, the negative consequences than about the positive consequences. And lastly, the more a message is repeated, the more distorted it comes. Interestingly enough, even when you reintroduce the original message, it, that doesn't matter. Once, once that misinformation has taken hold, it's really, really hard to get rid of. Okay, so even if our loved ones are really wanting to share that new cure for a cold or that great new thing they heard about your asthma inhaler, um, they're trying to, but the problem is the message just gets distorted. And we're talking about health a lot with our friends and family. I would say it's maybe one of the main things that we talk about with our friends and family. Right? How are you doing? How's the knee? How's the, oh, I has a heart surgery going well? Yeah, great, 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 right? It's, it's a common topic. Um, so in 2012, there was a study of um, online cancer support group members. And what they found is that most of the information that they heard from someone other than their doctor or nurse was a rumor, was an untested, unproven rumor. That's the most, that's, that's a lot. 83% of what you hear from your friends and family is an untested rumor. Um, and most of those came from friends or family, mainly in face-to-face -face interactions. So this isn't a social media problem. This is a friends and family problem, okay? Um, surprisingly, we've seen this in other studies too, but the, the reason that you believe those rumors is not because the rumor sounds good, that's part of it, but it's because you trust the person who is telling you this, regardless of their expertise. Right? If your best friend tells you to try a new exercise regimen, you're probably going to do it, even though it sounds like bunk, because right? you trust your friend. Even though they're not a workout expertise, they're just slinging through it like you are. Right? But we trust the people that we are around, and sometimes, unintentionally, they can deceive us. Well, awesome. Cool message, Heather. Way to really bring us up on a Friday. Neat. 
All right. Well, I promised you that I would. I promised you I wouldn't leave you hanging, right? Um, so there are some things that we can do to fight misinformation on an interpersonal level. Again, this is the quick and dirty um, outline here, but I'll, I'll give you some tools for your arsenal. First and foremost, what I want to tell you is that information is not the best fight against misinformation. You are so tempted to tell your aunt that those oils are not going to do anything for her. Oh, you just want to so bad. Don't, right? Fight that because fighting misinformation with information is not going to work. Okay. And I will give you reasons why. Why? Why can't I just present someone some great evidence and then we can be done with this and this problem will go away? It is not that simple for several reasons. First and foremost, people who are more informed are actually more likely to be confident in their beliefs than those who are uh, correctly informed. Okay. Um, you maybe heard the, the Dunning Kruger effect. The more you know about the topic, the more you understand you don't know about the topic. And so when you are an expert on something, when you're out there getting the information, you realize I only have a part of, of the, the picture. There's so much out there that I'm probably not privy to. So I'm going to keep my mind open. If you know a little bit about a topic, you're like, I've done my research. I, I read that news article. So don't bother changing my mind, right? People get really stuck when they are more misinformed. So telling someone that you have the correct answer is probably not, no, they, they have the correct answer. What are you talking about? You're the wrong one right? It's just, it's a hopeless fight. Um, and, and what happens too is telling someone that they're wrong can actually backfire on you. So there's something called psychological reactants. I, I, lo I love this concept. And this is the idea that when someone feels that their freedom is being threatened, either their freedom of behavior or their freedom of thought, there's a couple of different avenues that they will take. And one of those avenues is they are going to double down. They are going to put their feet in and say, no, 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 no. Not you, not today. I, I have this right, okay? So if you're trying to convince someone of something, you might actually push them further into their misinformation, okay? So you can't just tell someone, no, I have the answer and you don't. It's not gonna work. Uh, number three, feeling educated doesn't actually translate to reliable outcomes. We've all thought, well, if they just have the right information, they'll do X, Y, Z, right? That's not how it works. Um, there was a really interesting study. This came from 2019. Um, that talked about, it was a, a study out of Wisconsin, and it showed that um, it looked at conservatives versus liberals in the topic of fracking. And it found that the more informed that conservatives felt about fracking, they were actually less likely to think that it's dangerous. And the more informed liberals were about fracking, they were more inclined to think that it's dangerous. So just giving someone the right information doesn't guarantee they're gonna do the right thing. Okay, so all of these are reasons why you can't, you can't just tell someone information, it's not going to work. So here's the first and foremost thing you have to do. If you want to change someone's mind, you have to start by listening. Okay, so I'm going to give you two uh, tools that you can use to help you be a better listener, particularly around health misinformation. Number one, this is, this is an old trick. It's not a trick. It's an old um, uh, tactic that has gone, uh, gone back many years. And it's the idea of motivational interviewing. This was created, um, I think in, in the field of psychology. Um, and it's used with psychologists and psychiatrists to get people to understand their own behavior, right? So this is the idea that you're questioning someone about feelings they may have about a behavior or a belief, um, but you're respecting that freedom of autonomy. You're not telling them that they're wrong. You're not giving them advice. You're helping them explore their own beliefs, okay? The goal here is to help them identify and resolve that gap between what they want and the way that they're acting, right? So you want to cure your asthma? That's great. Why are you not taking your medicine and instead, you know, going to a, a faith healer or handling snakes or whatever? Um, I'll take your question in just a sec. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a trick, right? Make them go, yeah, all right. Yes, because if you just give them the information, it's coming from you. But if they come up with it on their own, now it's their genius idea. Yeah, absolutely. So let me give you an example. So let's say you're talking to someone about getting a flu shot, right? You really should get a flu shot. Why on earth wouldn't you? you, you, what, are you what are you talking about? Don't you, don't you read the papers? Get your flu shot. No, this is not a way to get people to get the flu shot. Instead, start a conversation. So let's talk about what you think is the best way to avoid a bad flu season. So just in general, what do you think we can do to avoid a bad flu season? Okay. And that person says, 
uh, well, I don't know, stay healthy and don't blah, 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 and I shots or whatever. Okay, cool. So it sounds like you think the flu shots are part of the solution. Great. What, well, how big of a role do you think they play? And then get them talking about, you know, what, what role that may be and all those things. Okay, great. So if shots can help prevent um, some people from getting sick, who do you think should get those shots? So you're starting a conversation and you're letting them come up with these ideas on your own. Right. And then this idea, in your opinion, why should those people get the flu shot? Um, but you shouldn't. What's what's the I just want to understand your thinking. Right. And you're trying to be neutral. You're trying to help them think through this process on their own. Now, you are not going to change someone's mind in one conversation. That's not how it's going to work. But the idea is that you're getting them to think about the reasons behind their behavior, because oftentimes we do things that feel comforting and certain to us without really thinking through why we're doing them. So if you can get someone to elucidate, okay, cool, wh why are you doing this? Awesome. Maybe they have a reason, maybe they don't. Um, but it gets them thinking about it in their own terms, okay? There's another tool that I really like, which is street epistemology. I stole this from streetepistemology.com. It's a whole website. It's a whole movement. It's a group of guys who have started actually just going out into the streets and asking people to have conversations about difficult topics. Um, and so the idea here is that we're trying to help people think about um, the reasons that they believe something. So not necessarily why are you doing what you're doing, but why are you believing the evidence that supports what you're doing, right? So the goal is a little bit different. It's, it's to help people critically evaluate the evidence that they're using to support their belief, okay? And there are um, six steps to this. I'm just going to run through them because you can read all about this on streetepistemology.com. Um, but the idea is that you're building rapport, you're showing people that you care for them. I'm invested, let's have a conversation, great. Um, number two, you're, um, you're asking them, okay, well, how do you feel about X, Y, Z, right? How do you feel about chemotherapy? I don't know, do you, do you believe it? Do you trust it? Cool, understand where they're actually coming from because maybe you're assuming that they believe something that they, they don't actually. So allow them that chance to kind of clarify what they feel. Um, clarify how confident they are on that right? So, um, okay, so you think that uh, eating tangerines is going to clear your cold. Are you like 100% on that or like a 50%? Like, where are you, where are you on that, right? Just kind of let them explore the base of where they're coming from. Um, and then identify and clarify why they're believing that, right? Wh where have you, where have you read this? Who have you talked to? What, what evidence um, do you have? Where did it come from, right? And then getting them to think about, okay, wonderful. Do you think that all of these sources are, are great? Do you think maybe some of them might be trying to sell you something? Do you think maybe some of them might be misremembering things? Like how confident are you in your sources? Um, and then really importantly, know when to say when, right? Know when to walk away. You wanna leave the person with a positive experience of this conversation. If things are getting hostile, if things are getting tense, then that's uh, cool, cool. We're gonna, we're gonna time out here. So again, the idea is not just getting them to explore their behavior, but getting them to explore the evidence that they feel justifies that behavior. Because I think for all of us, when we sit down and we think about why do I believe the things I believe, sometimes those things kind of fall apart when you think about it really, really carefully. You're not going to solve the world in one conversation. You're just not. I don't care who you are. But it's a start of getting your loved ones and the people that you care about to really think critically about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And I just, wanna, I just wanna repeat that, you alone are not responsible for saving the world, okay? There are systemic issues that we as a people need to fix around health misinformation. There are um, technological advances that can help us um, solve this issue, right? Um, we need, someone needs to control Twitter. They're not doing it right now. That's not your job, right? So, so just don't feel like you have to correct every single piece of misinformation that comes your way. You don't have to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give I'm gonna clear your schedule here. I'm gonna give you uh, some good reasons to not engage with people, even though you may want to. Okay, number one, just let it go. If finding the resources to try to debunk the, the misinformation takes more time and effort than it's worth. Okay, if 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 you're uh, if your grandma wants to think that taking the daily supplements is going to, fine, whatever, you can dig up a bunch of research, but is that a good use of your time? It probably, probably not, right? Your time is very valuable, and I don't want you to think that you have to go out there and save the entire universe, because who got time for that, right? Number two, some of these things will debunk themselves fairly quickly anyway. Um, some of the fads that we see, some of the health misinformation we see, it clears itself up 
without us really having to do any sort of work. This is actually a real headline from the uh, Wall Street Journal from the 1930s. Um, there was in the 1900s, um, uh, radiation therapy was really popular because hot springs were found to be kind of, you know, they have radiation in them. So the thinking was the more radiation, the better. So we started drinking like radioactive drinks and we started like sitting under radioactive lights. There was a, this, there was a gentleman who, um, he actually made specific radium drinks and he published them to the public and he drank like three a day on his own just to prove how healthy he was. Yeah. His, his jaw actually just fell off because don't drink radium. Um, but so that kind of cleared itself up fairly quickly. Um, and surely there were some, some issues that came with that, but sometimes these things, you just, you let them roll past because you know that they're not going to stick around anyway. Right. And finally, when the misinformation isn't doing a ton of harm, but correcting it would, right? Um, if, if your mom is buying $27 face creams with activated charcoal in it, let it go. It's fine. That, that is not a fight that you want to have. It's not worth it, right? The outcomes are going to be more negative than the innocuous face cream. On the other hand, if your mom is getting, you know, second mortgages to buy activated charcoal, then we need to step in. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes it's, it's okay. Just, just let people do what they want to do. Sometimes these things will clear them up on their own. So it's not up to just you, I promise. Um, but there are some things you can do just to get people thinking. Okay. Uh, and so with that, I would like to stop talking and put it over on you. Do I have any burning questions? From like a misinformation perspective, everything that gets the attention of science usually starts out of some kind of rumor or anecdote. Ooh. That's why we end up looking into it. Sure. So how should misinformation and people that are interested in this topic sort of think through these emerging trends? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And that could be a that could be a line of research for me, right? De debunking myths. Um, it's important to pay attention to the misinformation that's out there, right? So like, even if you're not buying into it, you should know what your friends and family are, are doing around health. You should know what they're believing. You should know what they're thinking, right? Because identifying the misinformation is, is important just to understand the lay of the land. Um, but you're right. Like sometimes it's, it's rumors that make people excited to jump into something and look at, well, is there really something there? And so I would say some of those longer lasting rumors are the ones that we should be looking at, right? So like the ulcers idea, we, we thought, well, we thought it was stress for so long that was causing ulcers. And then we gave all these people all the stress relief stuff and they were still getting ulcers. And it's like, well, wait a second. So that turns out to be debunked. So now where do we go? So I think it's those long lasting mistruths that are the ones we should really be paying attention to and understanding why people are, are passing them on in the first place. What about that particular mistruth is, are people really connecting to, right? Yeah, I guess I was getting more at like, sometimes in the beginning, you don't actually know what's a mistruth, yeah. what's a rumor that's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. like. How, how should people that are interested in misinformation think through mm. the difference between something that's false and something that ends up being true and ends up entering the scientific establishment? Yeah, I mean, it can be hard to tell from the get-go what is, what is legit and what is not. I mean, again, I fall for health misinformation. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, to your question, do... Do the research that you believe is accurate. Go to trusted sources and understand on yourself, why am I trusting these sources, right? Am I reading this website that was made by someone in, you know, Wichita with a lot of time on their hands, or am I reading academic studies, right? And I understand that not everyone has access to research, which I think is a crime. I think that is a travesty that people do not have more access to better peer-reviewed research, um, but yeah, I mean, if something intrigues you and you, you, you're not sure about it, go down that rabbit hole for yourself and figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I just, I don't know if there's a question, but the, the continuum between scientific information and misinformation yeah. seems so thin mm -hmm. in some places that mm -hmm. you jump from one to the other. So it's just fascinating to, yeah. to, um, to think of that as a continuum and when you make the leap from like the end. And now that right. is absolutely the most perfect thing. You should never For now. Yoga. Yeah. Five years ago, you should have. Absolutely. So I'm, so I just think that continuum is super interesting. And I also think the way we communicate health information, I'm curious about 
the um, infinity in which we say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus this is what we know right now. A hundred percent. And and yes, effects of that. And that is a really frustrating thing for a lot of scientists. Um, and that's why we have a new field of science communication. Because uh, I'm going to give you a tip here. If anyone comes up to you and tells you that anything is 100% anything, they are wrong. <laughs> Nothing is, I, I cannot tell you with certainty. I can tell you with certainty, but I cannot tell you 100% that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. I, I don't know that. I'm 99.999% sure. But am I 100%? No. Right? And so a good scientist will never say, this is absolutely the cause of this, no questions asked. Especially in social science, there's just so many variables, there's so many confounds. But that turns into, so are you saying there's a chance, right? And so people who don't necessarily understand the scientific continuum will latch on to that. Well, there's a 0.1% that you're, chance that you're wrong. So I like those odds, right? And I mean, I, I, the, I, what I would say to, to people who are not in the scientific community is think about odds, right? Are you 95% sure that that treatment is gonna cure your psoriasis? Those are pretty good odds. Okay, try it out. Are you 50% sure? Maybe you should do some more work. Maybe you should talk to more people, right? But you can never be 100% and that's really frustrating because people latch onto that and they say, see, you don't even know. You can't even tell me. And that's not, that's not the spirit of it, yeah. I think this is all, first of all, I love your presentation. And Thank you. A lot about trusted sources and mm -hmm. where information comes from and often where misinformation comes from. And one of the things that I think about often is that we want to be able to trust in science and trust in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, especially in the black community, there's yes. already a, a history yes. of mistrust and distrust yes. in the system because of instances like the Tuskegee experiment mm -hmm. and you know violence against black bodies in general. Mm -hmm. So I feel like how we communicate now, how we believe in the system is difficult, especially Absolutely. in certain specialties. We don't always have a lot of information about, you know, like in dermatology specific, black skin, yeah. how it reacts to certain yes, things. Yes, so for sure. It's hard as a person living in that community yes. to trust in the community. I totally get it. So I can understand how this, this and malinformation yes. exists. How do you either inform or help those people believe yeah like, what do you do yeah do you... I'm so glad you brought that up because that was actually part of my presentation that I had to take out for time but the idea that there someone told me I had to be on a strict timeline <laughs> but there are there are entire communities people of color women in general people with invisible illnesses people with chronic pain people with confusing diagnoses right autoimmune disorders who have historically time and time again they have shown to be not listened to to be gaslit to be ignored. They are treated differently in the healthcare system. And when that happens to you, you distrust the system and rightfully so. And so you go outside and you find, you find your own sources of information, which is typically the people that you trust. So um, in those instances, I would say for those communities, we have to get to the trusted community leaders and we have to get them on board of understanding um, what rumors are out there why people are attaching to them and how we can replace that information with better information. Because that's especially where interpersonal communication comes in a ton. You're not gonna hit those audiences with a poster, right? They're gonna walk on by. But if you can get to a community leader and give them the good information and know that then they're gonna spread it from person to person to person, to me, that seems like a very difficult thing to do, but kind of the only way that we're gonna get to those populations. I, Making sure that if you're, you're talking about some things in this community. Is there research that has been done on that specific? For community? sure. going to back it up so that we have something to hold on to. Absolutely. Oh, you know, this blanket statement of if you do this, then this. Okay, well, perhaps in, you know, in white communities or, you know, right. communities that are not people. Right. right. It makes sense. But for us, does it really? Right. And that's why I love that for the longest time, science was a, a white guy's domain, right? And so we had research on white people. We had research on men. Um, and that's that's where a lot of this comes from. But now we're getting more diverse voices and we're giving people a chance to come up to the table and that can only help us because now we're getting research on more diverse populations and we're expanding what we know and it's not always the same for every different population. So I 100% agree with you. All right, hold on one second. Because we, we're about to lose people on Zoom uh, potentially. And so since Heather just accused me of being mean and short in her talk, I feel like this is the moment to stop for a second. Uh, and one, say thank you again to Heather. We really love you. Thank you.
Um, I really want to really thank you for people I have, for any business for the noon. Um, I want to throw the note up here about our next two McGovern lectures. The QR code actually goes to our website if that's helpful to you. But uh, we have two more already scheduled talks in the series. And so Jay's going to be here on April 6th. Uh, and Ashani's going to be here April 26th. It's kind of our next two already planned speakers. We're working on maybe one more that might be in May. Uh, but we'll share information about that as soon as we can. So if Heather would like to kind of hang around and answer more questions, we can do that. Yep. I really wanted to say thanks again for being here Friday. Yeah, we have to very quiet on Friday, Shirley. Uh, and thanks to all the folks who joined on Zoom, too, for this talk. Uh, Heather, yeah. couldn't, couldn't hope for more to get the series started this year. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Do people have to go? We can take a couple more questions. I mean, I'm here. Did I saw I, I I yeah, there was someone way back there. I was just gonna ask, um, I don't want to politicize this, yeah. but it seems like sometimes the response to um the open communication that you're trying to provide is yeah. like so and so said it would work. And then that's yeah. kind of like the end of the conversation. Right. Like there are no facts. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like it came from a higher up. Like I think of Ivermectin sure. where there's like no, I know. Yeah. But, um how do you respond to that if there's not even a conversation about the facts? That's fair. I mean, it, it can make these conversations almost impossible, right? And so that's why that's why I'm telling you, you're not gonna you're not gonna change the world with one conversation. This is an ongoing thing. And so in that instance, when someone's believing something that came from one specific person, maybe we can have that ongoing conversation of, okay, great. Well, so why why do you why do you like this person? What, what about this person you show? Oh, cool. So does this person have like any medical experience or like, why, why do you think they're saying that? Just kind of getting them to explore, why am I believing this one person above all those things? And it's a super hard process because again, that's a vivid story. I can take some harster wormer and I can live forever, right? That's a vivid story that is easy to attach to. And so those are ones that are hardest to remove. Um, so yeah, I, I would say just kind of getting them to question, okay, well, who's your source on that? What, what, where, where did they get their information? That's cool. Maybe we should look into this and kind of opening up, thinking about maybe getting more than one source, right? Did we, did, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was interested in when you broke down how to talk to people, yeah. when they have a different opinion from you or when they have a strong opinion. Um, I do the same thing. Like I didn't read anything about it, just how I naturally think yeah. as a therapist, you approach them and be like, they'd be like, oh, what do you think about like something really controversial? And then you go, what do you think about it? And then they go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you go, well, interesting. So why do you think that? And then they go, blah, and then you go, why and why and why? Eventually, um, I have people like breaking down, crying about when they're three, their mom left them. <laughs> so like, what happens when you go too far into this? Yeah, thing? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Um, and again, I would say if you're, if you're trying to have these conversations and they're getting out of whack, you know, step number six, always leave them with a positive experience. If something is, <laughs> if something is going bad, okay, cool. Let's go get some lunch and talk about the weather. Right. Um, so always remember that they, that they had a good conversation. And the same thing too, is when you're challenging, not challenging someone, when you're getting someone to think about why you believe that source, it's really hard to keep that positive, right? It's really hard to let that end on a positive note. But it's like, oh, well, it sounds like you're really invested in this topic. I really admire that about you. That's really great that you care so much about that. That's great. Um, we should we should keep together, like learning more about this. I think there's more we can we can learn about it. And you seem like a curious person. So kind of again, you know, flattery gets you everywhere, oh. right? And leaving people on a positive note, even when it's it, this is really hard to do. This is really hard to do. I'm not very good at it. Um, and it takes it takes practice for sure. Yeah. Did you have a question? Um, I was just wondering about if you have like any examples of uh, ways to combat misinformation and disinformation or more bad ways to say. Yeah, there's been a lot of research around if you're going to correct someone. So let's say you are not let's say it's online and it's you're not able to have that open conversation which in this context that's what we're looking for um there's been research that says that if you simply just tell someone that what they believe is false it leaves kind of a blank space in their brain so you're taking that misinformation out but now there's just a gap and so they're going to fill it with whatever they want so there's a, a theory and it's there's the it's kind of kind of on the fence on whether or not it's correct um, but if you try to remove a piece of misinformation, you should put a good piece of information in its place. 
So there's things called direct and indirect um, corrections. So this idea of ivermectin doesn't work. Everyone knows that. Well, well, no. Now you're taking that information away and there's a gap. So instead of saying ivermectin actually uh, really hasn't been proven to, be, to, to work very well. Actually, what has been shown to work well. And so giving them that positive piece of information to, to replace that, that gap that you created. And that's something that you can do online too, right? Instead of just saying, this is dumb, we're not talking about this anymore. Giving them, taking away that misinformation and giving them a piece of good information to kind of replace it. Again, research is, is kind of all over the board on whether or not that's, uh, we're, the, the, the word's still out on that, but that's one tactic that you can use. Yes. I think a lot of people get their health information. You know, like we see Good Morning America, there's always the like, life. Well, did you know drinking 1.5 liters of wine a day is oh, I love those know, reports. Yeah. <laughs> libido or you know oh yeah and people hear that and they're like oh. and then a week later they'll be like did you know that drinking wine is going to kill you tomorrow right um and so you know it'll be like the latest study shows mm -hmm. and that they so I'm curious like as researchers mm -hmm. and academics Kind of what are your thoughts as far as if there are ways to, I guess we could only be so lucky if Good Morning America got a hold of I mean, that's the, but, that's the goal, right? Yeah. But, you know, kind of how do you think about that when you are, you know, kind of publishing on health information? Yeah. Or the thing, and this, I spent a whole week on what is science and how do we talk about science and what do we think science does in my undergrad class? And this comes up a lot. And this idea that um, what I stress is that one study does not make a solution. One study has proven nothing ever, right? Even the ulcer drinking guy, like that, that got him started. But do you think we suddenly learned that ulcers were bacterium from that one dude? No, it started the ball rolling. So any one study is not useless, but it's not the whole story. And I think it's really tricky because when we try to put those in the media, we want those short, quick attention grabbing headlines, right? Because that's, that's what people are gonna remember. And so we're telling them eggs are bad, eggs are good, coffee's bad, coffee's good, right? And it, it, it's, it's confusing. And so people who don't understand the scientific process, they can go see, they, they don't know. They're just, they're teetering top of that. So I don't necessarily know I'm not a science communication specific person, which is a field that is growing great because we desperately need that. Um, but I think there's education out there of, of around, you have to look at science as a body instead of individual studies, right? Like I like to think that my research is pretty good, but one study of mine is not going to change the universe. It's going to be added to this collective body and we're going to stand on the shoulders of giants and we're going to together create this body of evidence right? And it goes back to this idea of evidence versus proof. Proof is, proof is a collection of evidence that seems to support an idea. No one piece can be proof. Well, I have proof that blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. You have some evidence that goes into this ball. But that's a really hard concept for people to get, especially people are busy. They're hearing a bunch of things all day, right? They don't want to sit and think about this. I understand that. So I don't necessarily know the answer, but I, I do know that there are people working on that and helping people understand, again, one study does not science make. Uh -oh. <laughs> did, I, did you have your hand up? I know sometimes with disinformation, like, especially pushing out new products, yeah. you know, things that fix these ailments or supposed ailments, yeah. people are latching onto that because they know that's a way to push a product. But do you think sometimes when people are building companies and coming up with ideas, there's interpersonal misinformation within that company. That's mm. why they came up with the idea in the first place. I feel like you have an example in mind. I don't know if I do. I, well, <laughs> maybe, but I mean, I can, I guess one would be like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Enlightened Nutrition, mm. but they're like, it's one of those like little smoothie brands or yeah. like green drink brands, whatever. And I remember for like for the longest time, like if you went into the store, like the girls there seemed very convinced that oh, yeah. whatever it was that they were producing was having these benefits on them right and it's like really i think there's actually a lot of information out there that that's not true right but the people working those stores selling it to you they really do believe that's it really they good point it. yeah um so do you think sometimes there's like not only the battle of fighting the people that know the information's wrong but also fighting the people that within making their own companies didn't necessarily know and they yeah. think it's true yeah i mean i, I think I, that goes back to the idea of identity right if i work for a company and they're paying me i'm going to believe that that company is doing something good so whatever they tell me this product is doing, I'm sure. Yes, awesome. I want to believe that I'm helping save the world. 
so it kind of goes into that idea of this is who I am and I'm, I'm peddling good things and I'm helping the world. But I think the problem is when you tie this up with identity, then it becomes too personal. And then it becomes seated down here and giving that up. Now, suddenly you gave up part of who you are and what do I do from there? So you're right. I think there's a lot of really well-intentioned people who started off with a really good idea of maybe this will work. And down the road, you have to believe in your own ideas, right? So it becomes this fervent, no, 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 I know this works. I know it does because I built my life on it. And so that's that's really hard, especially when you get marketing in there. I mean, because they're holding on to this whole idea, right? Do I have any marketers? I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, maybe one or two other questions? Yeah. I, first of all, I love your 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 presentation. It was very you. and very engaging. And I'm thinking about interpersonal communication between a layman and an expert. Sure. So when I go to a, a attendance office, yeah, there's this whole debate about fluoride, and I have two daughters and about fluoride causing early puberty and XYZ. Sure. I have to admit that my doctor, I'm not seeing my doctor's uh, suggestion here about fluoride does not cause harm because, you know, it does not. Uh, there's research has not proven, but there's also enough evidence that shows that it does. Sure. So I feel like sometimes as experts, they choose to hook on to science in one way, but not the other. Like, sure. Yes, science is proven, but it also keeps growing. So really like your point about identity yeah. and how evolving, I mean, the fact that they're doctors and then oh, 100%. Yeah, they're experts, yeah. but at the same time, what you know is also limited. Right. So unless you're really on top of what science is doing, and yeah. you can't really claim to be the expert. Yeah, fair. And there's a lot of face work that goes into that, right? If you come to your doctor and you're like, I think you're wrong. Well, your, your doctor is in charge of your health, right? Like they're not going to say, I probably am, right? They're, they're going to want to keep their credibility. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really good providers will say things like, well, that's really interesting. Where did you get that information? Okay, cool. Well, well what do you think? And again, they'll try to use those tactics to get people talking about why do you trust this source and what do you believe and kind of leading that open. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, doctors are not trained enough on communication, I believe. Um, some of them are amazing at it, but it's not necessarily a core thing that they're taught in medical school, in, in, in many medical schools. Um, so you're right. I think a good physician will kind of open it up instead of knocking it down. But that's, that's really space threatening for an expert, for sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and did you have uh, one last question? Yeah, just to going back to what you just talked about, like weighing the, the kind of the totality of the evidence, like yeah. and deciding whether it's good for you or bad for you. And also like sometimes, you know, scientific research, they publish like seemingly conflicting findings. But oh, yeah. like, actually, it may be because like people don't understand, like you mentioned, like how science works or how like uncertainty is part of like scientific research. And you also mentioned a little bit about like education like so people can really understand and thinking about like what you mentioned how to correct or uh, misinformation through like interpersonal communication but then like i'm maybe too judgmental i feel like if a person tends to believe this piece of misinformation related to like x house topic maybe that person tends to believe then that's yeah from a really to y topic so like like you cannot correct like every time so i'm just thinking about at a more like Marco level? Are there any strategies yeah. that you can kind of, and also like, because you mentioned like science education or something like that. So like, is there some way like to improve science education through interpersonal communication? I don't know. Oh. Oh. I, I don't know. I'm just, oh. yeah. Want to hear. Well, I think first and foremost, I think all schools should be teaching media literacy. Some of them are, and I think they all should. I think it should be a course that you take in second grade um, and you learn, oh, my, like uh, some of my college students still think that the first result on Google is there because it's the best. Dudes, no, right? We're, we, we gave people a tool without instructions on how to use it. So I think that's, this is one of those examples where the issue is not entirely yours to fix, right? There are some systemic issues that need to clear up that you, you have no control over, right? Um, and, and the idea that you're right, there have been studies that show that certain political beliefs are tied to certain health beliefs, that, that that's out there, that research is out there. But the interesting thing is the thing that you pointed out. Well, if one person believes X, then they're probably going to believe Y and they're probably going to believe Z. I see that as an opening because if I can get them to rethink X, then maybe they're going to start rethinking Y too, without me even directly bringing it up. And then that's going to lead them to start rethinking Z too. And that's, that's kind of how we, we start to undo 
some of that misinformation. Like interpersonal communication, because right. I saw I saw the excellent example you brought up there, but like I also feel like uh, a lot of the examples you showed focused on like a specific health issue, like mm -hmm. how to kind of plant a seed related to like science education or yeah. questioning the whole Thing, like yeah, I think they're related. I think if you can get someone to understand, okay, so you're you're taking ivermectin. Let's talk about that. Uh, you know, why do you why why do you think that? Tell me your sources. What do you think? Blah blah blah. blah. And you're educating them about how science works, right? Oh, so you saw one study that said that it might help in this particular population at this particular point in time. Cool. Do you think there's any other studies out there that maybe are more longitudinal? Do you think so? You're you're doing the science general education through that one context which can make people better consumers, right? So I, I think the weakness there is also the strength, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right, I feel like I've eaten up way too much of your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.